connected under the skin. And if you really want to follow the connections out wherever they lead, you need a little more space. So I'm going to tell a longer story, one that actually I'm going to probably take about 40 minutes to tell us to tell maybe like a third of a very long story that's uh, that's in the book. Um, and the story has to do with the lottery in the U.S. state of Massachusetts. Um, what you're looking at here is a picture um, from the very last drawing of a lottery game called Cash Windfall in Massachusetts. This is a picture from January 2012. Um, and the point of this story is to explain why this was the last drawing. In order, but in order to do that, let me start with a little kind of uh, starter about how lotteries work in general. Okay, so this is how a lottery works. You pay a small amount of money, let's say $2, and I'm gonna give a little simplified version to start with. Um, you pay a small amount of money for a small chance of winning a large amount of money. So for instance, let's say a lottery ticket costs $2, and maybe there's a one in 200 chance that you win $300 back. Oh, should I have changed the currency for this? That would have been thoughtful. Sorry, I didn't think to do that. Okay, well the story takes place in the United States. Um, so, if you play this game a thousand times, and people who play the lottery do play a thousand times, and people really like to play the lottery a lot. If you play this game a lot, if you play it a thousand times, well, how many times are you gonna win? Well, of course, there's variation in that, it's random, but if there's a one in 200 chance of winning, in your thousand plays, you'll probably win about five times, right? So that means you win five of those $300 prizes, or $1,500. Sounds pretty good. Uh, until you think about the fact that you spent $2,000 in tickets to get that $1,500 in winning. So the sort of term of art that mathematicians use uh, to talk about this kind of computation is expected value. So we would say the expected value of this ticket is $1.50. That is how much you're gonna win on average per play. So that's the mathematical term. I gotta say though, that it's sort of a terrible term. It's one of those that we wish we could take back. We can't, the notation is what it is. But it's, it's a bad piece of terminology because the expected value, whatever it means, it certainly does not mean the value we expect that ticket to have. In fact, it's not even a possible value for the ticket to have, right? That ticket is either worth nothing or it's worth $300. But it is definitely not worth $1.50. So somehow, if we had it to do over again, we would probably call this the average value, which is a much more reasonable summation of what we're actually trying to describe. $1.50 is how much the average ticket is worth. Um, on the other hand, the average ticket costs $2. In fact, all the tickets cost $2, and a fundamental rule of thumb is that you shouldn't pay $2 for something that's worth $1.50. And here you have, in a nutshell, uh, the mathematical case against playing the lottery. And now I'll complicate that a little bit. Um, so what you're looking at here is an actual list of payoffs for a lottery game in Massachusetts, the regular state lottery. Um, the exact numbers are not important, but I want you to look at this computation at the bottom. Um, you don't have to check it for yourself, but uh, what I want to point out is that the example I gave at the beginning, the simplified example, was unrealistic in a couple of ways. One way it was unrealistic is that there was only two classes of prize. Real lotteries are not like this. Real lotteries have a lot of different prizes. They have a big jackpot that you get if you get all the numbers correct. Um, but that jackpot is really hard to win and it's kind of demoralizing for people. If there were only the jackpot, people probably wouldn't play, right? Because they probably wouldn't feel like they could win. So, jack so the real lotteries have like a whole sequence of lower tier prizes, some of which, like matching three out of the six numbers in the Massachusetts Lottery, are really not that hard to win at all. The payoff is kind of low, only $5, but you have a one in 47 chance of winning. That means if you play a lot, if you play every day, probably every so often you're gonna win, and it's quite common for like a friend of yours to win or somebody you know to win. Um, so it keeps people playing, right? Running a lottery has a lot to do with psychology. So that's one way that my simplified example was unrealistic, too few tiers of prizes. The other way, my, um, my simplified model was unrealistic, is that it was incredibly generous to the, play, to the players. No real lottery pays back $1.50 for every, uh, as the average value of a $2 ticket. This Massachusetts lottery, the expected value of a $2 ticket was just 80 cents. 
That's a lot lower. In fact, I was looking actually at some lotteries that are played here. Does anybody play Euro Millions? That's a 40 cent expected value on a two, or a, well, a 0.4 of a Euro expected value on a two Euro ticket. That's insanity. That's what, this would never be tolerated in the United States. I just want to tell you guys that. Um, even American lottery players would be like, that is a stinker of a game. <laughs> People who like play this every day would like not play Euro Millions. Um, okay, so, um, as I said, the, um, the reason you don't have a jackpot, don't have just a jackpot, is because it's demoralizing when nobody wins. If people are not winning the jackpot, people start to get depressed and people stop playing. And this is what happened in the state of Massachusetts in the year of, um, of about 2004, 2005. A whole year went by without anybody winning the jackpot. And they could see at the Lottery Commission that people were stopping playing the game. People were depressed, they didn't feel like there was a chance, and um, it wasn't working. So they said, we gotta make a change. We gotta do something to goose interest in our game. So they instituted a new rule, a rule called the roll-down rule. Let me explain how it works. They said, instead of just letting that money pile up in the jackpot, right? because if nobody wins the jackpot, the jackpot pool gets bigger. That money that is not given out in prizes just kind of makes the jackpot bigger and bigger and bigger. They said, okay, that is not satisfying people because they feel like that jackpot may get bigger and bigger and bigger, but I'm never going to win. They said, let's make a new rule. If that jackpot goes over $2 million and nobody wins the jackpot, that drawing, then it's going to roll down. All that money is going to roll down into the lower tier prizes and make them bigger. Well, that's exciting. That's maybe a good way to get people interested. Um, so they were trying to design a game that looked like a better deal for the player. Um, and in fact, they did their job a little bit too well. <laughs> I can always tell how mathy an audience is by how big a laugh I can get with a table. That's always, um... <laughs> so this is what the payoff matrix for, um, for the Massachusetts Cash Windfall Lottery looked like on February 7th, 2005. Um, so for instance, that four out of six prize, there's a one in 800 chance of winning. You remember in a usual drawing, that was a $150 prize. On this roll down day, in which no one won the jackpot, that prize was actually worth almost $2,400. So stop to think about that. There's a one in 800 chance of winning and the prize is worth $2,400. So if you bought 800 tickets, you were probably gonna win $2,400 right there for the $1,600 you spent buying 800 tickets. And that's just the four out of six prizes, right? There's other prizes too, each of which has a value. And when you add it all up, you find that the average value of a $2 lottery ticket sold on this day um, was $5.53. So that is not a bad investment. Um, so how do I know, by the way, exactly what the payoffs were for this? Why do I know what payoffs were for this particular day of the Massachusetts State Lottery? Um, I know it because I read about it in the following document, which you shouldn't be able to like read from wh where you sit, but uh, let me tell you what this is. Um, this is a 25-page letter from the Inspector General of the State of Massachusetts uh, to the State Treasurer uh, trying to explain what had happened to the State Lottery. <laughs> Um, and I gotta tell you guys, um, I, I, I feel safe in saying this is the only fiscal oversight document by a municipal official that you will ever read that makes you wonder if somebody has the movie rights to it. It really is kind of a crazy story, which again, in the book I tell at length, here I'm gonna tell it to you somewhat briefly. Um, what happened? Um, well, what happened is that on February 7th, 2005, um, the state lottery started getting phone calls. For instance, they got a phone call from a star market in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is like a convenience store, um, saying some college kids uh, just came in and want to buy 5,000 lottery tickets. Is that okay? So there's a rule, you know, if somebody, if a single buyer wants to buy a lot of lottery tickets, they have to call the state lottery and, make, and get a, a special waiver, but this, this is granted. And by the way, this was not the only place. There were similar large buys um, in several places around the state. But what was going on? What was going on is that there are a lot of people who could make a table like the one that I just showed you. And some people did. Um, 
so for instance, um, one of the main players of the story are two, uh, it's a guy from MIT called James Harvey. He was a senior at MIT at the time. And, um, and as it happened, he was doing an independent study project in January of 2005 on the expected value of state lottery tickets. He was a lucky guy. And as part of his project, um, he computed the value of like all currently running Massachusetts lottery games, and presumably he drew a table very much like the one I just showed you, and the first thing he did was go around to all of his friends in his dorm at MIT and say, like, you should really give me all the money that you have right now so I can go buy lottery tickets with it. Um, and if you go to MIT, I think everybody in your dorm can also compute that table and see that that's actually a wise idea. And so they sort of coalesced their money and, um, and, bought, and bought all those tickets uh, in Cambridge. There was another group uh, called the Dr. John Lottery Club, which was based around uh, biomedical researchers uh, at Northeastern University, which is also in Boston. Um, and then maybe my, my favorite guy um, was a guy called Jerry Selby, who was a retired engineer in Michigan. How did he happen to hear about it? Well, where did Massachusetts get the idea for this roll-down rule? They got it from a roll-down game in Michigan that had just closed. <laughs> I'm not sure they asked Michigan why it closed. But Jerry Selby knew why it closed, because he had made about $2 million off the Michigan game over the previous seven years or so. So he, was, he could not believe his ears when he saw that Massachusetts was opening the gates again. So he immediately got in the car with his wife and drove to like the nearest point in the state of Massachusetts to Michigan. But that's, that's pretty far, guys. I don't know if everybody like knows the location of all the US states, but that's probably about a 14-hour drive, I'd say. Um, and he made a big buy up in the northwest corner of the state and kept on doing this. So um, the story that is outlined uh, in this long 25 page document is the way that these three groups of high volume players um, continued to buy more and more lottery tickets, uh, taking their winnings and plowing them back into the investment scheme and buying yet more until um, by the time this reached some kind of equilibrium, just to give you some sense, uh, the Inspector General estimates that on a given roll down day, somewhere between 80 and 90% of all tickets sold in cash windfall were being sold to a member of one of these three groups. <laughs> um, so how does this story end? Um, well, it ends like this. This is the front page of the Boston Globe uh, in summer 2011. At some point, somebody figures out this is going on. The Globe gets tipped off and they run this story explaining what's going on with the state lottery. And at this point, the game is up, right? If once people perceive that the game is not what it seems, uh, then people stop playing and then it doesn't work anymore. Then no more money flows into the system. Um, so, th so, in a way, that's the end of the story, but if you read it from a mathematical point of view, the chronological end of the story is not really the end, right? Because as mathematicians, there are some puzzles that remain. At least they remain for me when I was like reading this story and I was trying to read it with a mathematician's eye and trying to understand what really went on here. So I'm gonna spend the rest of our time together talking about two mathematical puzzles that I think we're left with, having told the bare bones version of this story. Um, one is easy, one is hard. Let's start with the easy one. Um, the first puzzle is, how could you actually get away with this? This is a little weird, right? Let me remind you that the state knows who's winning the lottery, right? Because they have to give you the money. So it's not a secret. The state knows that all the winning numbers are coming from the same three convenience stores again and again. Let me remind you something else. If you guys are paying attention to the dates, when's that first roll down? February 2005. When's this article in the Boston Globe? July 2011. <laughs> so there was time to figure out that something was amiss. This is six years we're talking about. Um, so this is puzzle one. How did the state not figure out what was going on? Well, this is the, the, the reason this puzzle is easy. No, I like bureaucrats, okay. Um, so the reason this puzzle is easy is, is the following. Here's the answer. The state did figure it out. 
And how do I know this? I know it because it's in the Inspector General's report. And in fact, I slightly lied to you. I said that when James Harvey figured out that the new Massachusetts lottery game had a positive expected value, I said the first thing he did was get money from all of his friends in his dorm and go buy a lot of tickets. But no, that is the second thing that he did. The first thing he did, because kids who go to MIT are like, good kids who like play by the rules and get good grades, right? The first thing he did was get on the subway and go to Braintree, Massachusetts and go to the state lottery headquarters and have a meeting with them. And he said, look, your new game has a positive expected value. I'm planning to buy thousands and thousands of tickets and make a lot of money. Is that legal? <laughs> <laughs> and the inspector general does not record exactly what response he got to this query. But it must have been something like, sure, knock yourself out, because the next thing that happened was what I just told you, and then it went on happening for another six years. Okay, so that's the answer to that puzzle, but that answer uh, kind of spawns another question, as so often happens. Um, so the que the, it spawns the question, why didn't the state do anything about it? If the state knew from day one that this was going on. Okay, so uh, to answer this question, I need to use a very sophisticated mathematical diagram which represents the limit of my PowerPoint <laughs> skills. So what's actually going on here? Random Strategies, I should say, is the name of James Harvey and you run, uh, James Harvey's team. Uh, it's the name of his group of people. Um, you might object that their strategy was really not very random at all. What's, what's actually going on here is that the dorm they lived in was called Random Hall, which is a place at MIT, and that, that was where the money was coming from. So. Um, how should you think of what's going on here? Well, I want to remind you one more very important thing about how the lottery works, which is this. When a lottery ticket is sold for $2, Massachusetts takes 80 cents of that money, and that's state revenue, right? That's what goes to pay police officers and pave the streets and keep the lights on and do all the things that the lottery is intended to do. And then the rest of that money is eventually going to get dispersed in prizes in one form or another. So what does that mean? That means that from the point of view of the state, the amount of money it makes is 80 cents times the number of tickets sold. The state does not care who wins the lottery. The state only cares how many tickets are sold. So this is a crucial point because um, when this story came out in the newspaper, I think it was presented as that these folks had somehow cheated the state out of a lot of money. In fact, the Inspector General estimates that the state of Massachusetts took in somewhere between 10 and 15 million dollars extra revenue above what they would have had these three large groups of bettors not existed. So I think it's safe to say that somehow if you come away with an eight-figure win, um, you are not the person who got scammed. So what's going on? Where was this money coming from? Well, of course, the money was coming from the people who were playing the lottery on the non-roll-down days. So that's what, this, uh, that's what this figure is meant to emphasize. You should think of what was happening as a movement of money from all the regular players to these groups of people who are playing only on the roll down days, um, with Massachusetts getting eight, 80 cents every time a ticket is sold. Maybe a good analogy is like this. Um, again, when this story came out in the newspapers, it was sort of at the same time, actually, that there was a big story about uh, MIT students um, uh, winning a lot of money at Blackjack. Does anybody remember this story in Las Vegas casinos? And so it was sort of, the, these two stories were talked about in a breath. They said, how did the kids at MIT figure out how to beat the house? Okay, let me explain why that's wrong. What were the kids at MIT doing? They were making a lot of bets, right? They were buying, just to give you the scale, about 200,000 tickets every roll down day. Um, they were making a lot of bets, each one of which had a small positive expected value. I should also say, by the way, that once a lot of people were playing, it didn't stay like $5.50 for a $2 ticket. It was more like a 15% profit on average. That's still pretty good. So they're making a small, and so some of those bets are gonna win, some of them are gonna lose. But if each one is slightly tilted towards the MIT kids, then on the whole, they're very likely gonna make money. So if that's your strategy, you're making a lot of bets which are slightly tilted in your favor. You are not beating the house. You are the house. 
I mean, that is what the house does. And so I think a productive way to think about what was actually going on um, math, from a mathematical point of view um, is, comp is to compare it to the following diagram, um, which is exactly the same. The kids from MIT and the other high volume bettors were playing the role of the casino. Um, the regular lottery players were playing the role of the regular bettors who come to the casino and bet. And they, in the aggregate, make lots of bets which overall have a slightly negative expected value and money is flowing away from them. And every time it does, every time the money flows in Las Vegas, um, the state of Nevada reaches in and takes a cut. Right? Because states don't like to gamble. States like to collect taxes. That's their skill set. That's what they're good at. And that's what they do. And that's what they were doing in Massachusetts. In other words, what you should think of as having happened is that the state of Massachusetts, I still don't know whether on purpose or sort of stumbling into it, had licensed a gigantic under-publicized virtual casino on which they collected lots of taxes and made a good profit, um, and which carried on until people found out about it. Um, so that, in the end, I think is the answer. I think that's a satisfying answer to the first question of, of how did this go on for so long? Um, but now I want to turn to the second question, which turns out to have quite a bit more mathematical heft. You see, I've been talking about these three groups of betters as if they were all the same, but that's not quite true. There's one very interesting difference between the three groups that um, the inspector generals point out, which is that Jerry Selby and Dr. John use what's called the quick pick machine. I don't know if there's an analog to that in the UK. Um, so what is this? This is a machine that picks random numbers for you to play. And that seems like a good idea, right? Because we all know that you can't predict what numbers the lottery is going to come up with. Any number is as good as the other. If you're going to buy 200,000 tickets, it certainly seems like it would save a lot of time and cost you nothing to have those tickets printed out randomly for you by machine. But random strategies, contra their name, did not do this. They filled out their tickets by hand, 200,000 of them. Why? Why do this? This is a humongous pain. And you know, the Inspector General's report mentions that they did this, but didn't say why. And I became kind of obsessed with this because I was like, these people are smart. They know what they're doing. They know math. They know that the expected value of each ticket is the same. Why would they care which tickets they had? That's what I want to spend the rest of our time together talking about. Um, so as mathematicians, when we're faced with a problem we don't understand, the first thing we do is we try to make it simpler. We try to replace our problem with a simpler problem, hopefully which has the same features, enough of the same features as the original one that we can use it to gain some insight. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, let me replace this lottery with a smaller game, which for reasons that are lost in history is sometimes called the Transylvanian Lottery. And here, instead of having 46 different numbers, like in the actual Massachusetts Lottery, there are only seven only seven balls in the cage. And instead of picking six of those, you're only gonna pick three. And the reason I do that is because it means that the number of jackpots is now so small that I can list them all on one slide. Here they are, all the different ways of picking three numbers out of seven. For the combinatorics fans in the audience, uh, the number of these is 35, which is seven choose three. And that's called seven choose three because it's the number of ways of choosing three things out of seven. Um, but it doesn't matter if you know that. It just matters that you believe me that uh, these are all the possible combinations. And now we can start to say, well, what if the game were this small? Let's see if we can understand what would be the benefit of choosing the numbers yourself as opposed to picking them randomly. Well, first of all, I have to sort of tell you what the rules of the game are now that I've shrunk it a little bit. Again, let's simplify. Let's not have like six different tiers of prize. Let's only have two. So in this simplified game, there's two kinds of prizes. You get a jackpot, which is worth $6 if you get all three numbers right. Order doesn't matter, by the way. I'm going to emphasize that. Um, if you get two out of the three numbers right, you have a smaller prize, which let's call a deuce, which is worth $2. And if you get one or zero of the numbers right, then you get nothing. So OK, this is very simple, but it has some of the features of the